This is QTV News. I am Antswane Esonyasi and thanks for joining us. First, the local business and international news headlines. In local news, the chairman and members of the Constitutional Review Commission call on President Barrow and members of government at State House. Recently knighted physician and scientist Professor Satwani Kora tells us about the prevalence and dangers of hypertension and diabetes in the Gambia. Ahead of an international conference addressing climate change in West Africa, experts brief the media at MRC. In business news, investing in Africa what are the four signs of hope that have probably been missed? In international news, today, the 15th January, marks the 50th anniversary of the end of the Biafra War. Berlin to host Libya peace talks, there are faint hopes that the chaos which has gripped the North African nation may be coming to an end. Stay tuned as we bring you more on these and other stories. First, the local news in detail. After the release of the draft constitution in November last year, officials of the Constitutional Review Commission mandated to draft a new constitution for the Gambia on Tuesday met the executive headed by President Barrow for a second face-to-face -face consultation. Alusise has that story. The meeting comes as the CRC chaired by Justice General Suleiman Jalo is about to wrap up its mandate of drafting a new constitution. Imagine after hours of closed door talks, the Information and Communication Minister, Ibrahim Asila, reveals that Cabinet has been busy looking at a draft constitution. Uh, as Cabinet, for the past uh, three and a half weeks, we have been discussing the draft constitution and Cabinet has uh, uh, prepared uh, a position paper uh, when we looked at uh, the draft I mean, uh, constitution and this was submitted to the uh, Constitutional Review Commission and today they came in to engage us on what we submitted to them. The Gambia's Attorney General and Minister of Justice Abubakar Tambadu said the meeting was part of the ongoing consultation by the CRC since the release of the draft constitution in November last year. Um, we have painstakingly gone through um, the entire provisions of the constitution and have um, submitted our observations um, to the CRC. It was as a result of those observations that the CRC um, engaged with cabinet today. And we hope that the CRC will take those uh, views on board as they um, go on to finalize this draft constitution. Could you kindly share with us what some of these observations were? Well, uh, I'm afraid I cannot do that. I think um, these observations are meant for the CRC in the same way that they have consulted with the judiciary and the legislature. He further revealed that President Barrow had commended the CRC officials, all of whom are Gambians, for producing what he calls an impressive draft within a short period. We have to remember that constitutions are never perfect. We can't have a constitution that takes on board every view. Um, so it is, in the end, a compromise document. Um, every sector will have a say. The important part, the important thing here is that people have been given an opportunity to have a say on how they wish to be governed. That is the most important aspect of this process. But ultimately, what the product is in the end is also equally important because we are looking at a constitution that will serve this country for generations to come. We're looking at the next 50, 100 years and not just now. For the chairman of the CRC, Justice General Suleiman Jalo, the commission is taking its time to review all the observations of the release of the draft. We are taking our time and going through every single document that has been submitted to us. So once we finish that process, uh, we will uh, you know, do a revision of the draft constitution, part of which we have already commenced based on the uh, submissions we have received. When we finish that process now, then we will perfect the document uh, and then submit it to the, to the president. Are you hopeful that you, you will be able to complete your work within the given time? Well, we are working, and, and I think that's, 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 that's the important thing. You remember, I mean, we had speculation that we would never produce a draft before with the end of the year. We did. But obviously, we don't go into that, uh, that, that discussion. But uh, uh, all things being equal, uh, we are confident that we will, hope we will complete the process uh, in not too long from now. 
The constitutional review process initiated by President Barr's government is taxed to come up with a constitution that truly represents the views and aspirations of majority of Gambians. Reporting for QTV News, I am Aliou Sise. Hypertension and diabetes are on the rise in the Gambia. These diseases combined can lead to serious health complications, including blood vessel damage, heart attacks, and kidney failure. Our reporter, Momodi Gajaga, spoke to a physician and scientist, Professor Satumanikora, on the effects of these diseases. Hypertension is often referred to as a silent killer because it increases the risk of heart disease and stroke, eventually leading to death. According to a 2018 publication by the International Journal of Epidemiology, 32% of adult deaths in the Gambia are as a result of hypertension. Yes, it is a growing concern worldwide. It is a growing concern in the Gambia as well. The change of lifestyle affects these diseases. Um, my grandfather, uh, who grew up in Tamba Sansang, and your parents who grew up in the Nyomis, walked in the field all the time. They really walked and spent energy doing this. Now with uh, modern status, sitting in cars, driving, no exercise whatsoever, these diseases are creeping up. Once you are hypertensive, treatment can be difficult especially if it is diagnosed late. Research is being conducted on the treatment of the disease, but as yet, there has been no major breakthrough. My one fear about this disease is that we tend to, that we do not assume that the treatment that is working in the North would work exactly the same way in Africa, and in the Gambia in particular. We need to do research on these diseases in the Gambia and find out what we need to do to reduce the, um, the, the, the incidence of this disease and how to fine-tune the treatment to be suitable for the African people. That is work that is ongoing in South Africa. That is work that needs to be done in all countries in Africa. The only way of minimizing or preventing diabetes and hypertension is through regular exercise and eating a healthy diet. Look, in the villages, in this, my beloved country, years by, people will wake up in the morning and what do they eat? Mono. Yes. That's what. And the coos one is fantastic. But we've left that now. We want, we're all eating bread. I think we should try and go back to basics. Eat what we grow and grow what we eat. We must exercise. And you know, I don't want to see people all flocking into gyms. I'm not against it. But if you take fast strides, Every day, up to 10,000 steps every day. Believe you me, you're as healthy as most people who are uh, filing themselves, finding themselves in the gym all day. So eat healthy, exercise, rest, and you should be fine. Healthcare in the Gambia is very poor. Health centers are facing a shortage of drugs, equipment, and staff. To combat these challenges, much more investment is required in the health sector. Health is expensive. If you want your people to be healthy, you've got to spend. It is not cheap. You must also focus on preventive treatments. Prevent the disease rather than try curing the disease. We must make sure that the budget for the health in this country is one that the doctors who are so well and highly skilled, trained and highly skilled, could become efficient. If you do not provide the doctors with the bare basic needs, if a malaria season is coming in August and by June you don't have anti-malarials in the country, then you're asking for trouble. Omudu Gajiga, QTV News. Officials at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine at the MRC and their partners on Wednesday held a media briefing on their level of preparedness ahead of next week's Planetary Health Conference. I attended the event and this is my report. The conference will bring together global, regional and national scientific leaders in the climate change field as well as policy makers to discuss the impact of projected environmental change on health and human well-being in the sub-region. It is expected to showcase and stimulate existing and new planetary health research conducted in West Africa with a focus on local and early career researchers. Ahead of its commencement next week, Organizers brief the media on what participants should expect as well as their level of preparedness. Speaking to journalists, 
Professor of Molecular Microbiology and Global Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Professor Martin Antonio, says the highly anticipated conference will help address challenges and provide possible solutions to the impact of climate change in West Africa. So not just for ECOWAS, but also for the African Union, because climate change and health is one of the issues that we know uh, affects a lot of um, countries, both in developed and uh, least developed countries. But Africa tends to be lacking when, when you look at the data. Professor Sidat Yafa, head of agronomy, School of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, and also the director of UTG Waskal Doctoral Research Program on Climate Change and Education at the University of the Gambia, says the conference will help the university and the country's young early researchers in their work. This conference is very essential because from a university perspective, we are mandated to do capacity building in the country. So I, I'm expecting one of the outcomes of this uh, international conference would be to initiate a uh, training program on climate change and public health. Speaking earlier, Assistant Professor in Nutritional and Environmental Epidemiology, Dr. Pauline Shelbeck, says the conference will present an opportunity for experience sharing. Environmental um, uh, heat impacts on health. So how is uh, this increasing temperature going to have an impact uh, on people in West Africa? Um, um, Anna Bernal is leading this and she's specifically interested also in pregnant women. Uh, and then the fourth one is around uh, air pollution and how, what sort of data is out there and how do people um, uh, people analyze this and how can you use that data uh, for uh, climate change and health uh, programming, uh, research and, and action. During the conference, participants will hold sessions on infectious diseases, air pollution, food security and sustainable cities. As part of its continued efforts to end all forms of human rights violations in the country, Bekanyang, a national human rights and development NGO, recently held a day-long sensitization workshop on female genital mutilation and cutting for young people in the Combo East. Alusisi reports. The workshop was held in Mandinaba, Combo East, and attended by young people drawn from Chloro and Mandinaba. Addressing the participants, Executive Director of Bay Kanyang, Famara Jaune, said the female genital mutilation or cutting has both short and long-term complications for women and girls. He cited, among other things, prolonged labor, severe pain, and excessive bleeding. To the participants, I extend once again our greetings to all of you. Today we are gathered here in your community, like I said, for a day-long sensitization workshop on the effects of FDMC, also known as female genital mutilation or cutting. The practice is a deeply rooted cultural practice in the Gambia and according to many, it requires concerted efforts to be addressed. Several speakers at the event commended Bay Kanyang for the initiative to enlighten the young people. Reporting for QTV News, I am Aliou Sise. A rare tourist attraction is gaining momentum and popularity at the Senegambia Strip. Feeding and uh, pool birthing birds have amazed locals, visitors and bird watchers who have observed this most unfamiliar and unusual activity. Mohamed Lamin Choi finds out what the lucky birds are and how important they are to our environment. The early birds are the lucky ones. Lucky vultures swoop down on the same place, waiting for their usual feeding time. Every morning before 11.30 a.m., dozens of vultures descend at this exact location of the Senegambia Beach Hotel. A bird watcher told me that the vultures' respect for time is amazing. Egrets also joined the feeding exercise, but because of their physical stature, they are too weak to scramble with the vultures. It is close to feeding time, and tourists are lined up, waiting to take a closer watch and take camera shots at the spectacular display of birds. And now comes feeding time, and a young man called Sertijan Jiba, employed in the bird watching business, brings a silver plate with chicken flesh for the always hungry looking creatures. <laughs> he whistles and thanks to their understanding of the call for food. The vultures swoop down in numbers, scrambling to feed. Only the luckiest ones get the meat that is not enough to feed all the scavengers. 
While some pick food from the ground and others in flight collect the thrown pieces of chicken flesh in the air, the chicken feed is finished but is far from enough to satisfy their hunger. Mm. But before the vultures fly away for scavenging, they are ushered for a bath, giving them a chance to drink, splash and dip into a pond. And from there, it is now time to spread their wings on the ground, ready for appearing sunbathing and to dry their wings. Dr. Christine Amann, a biologist from Germany who enjoys studying nature, is delighted at what she has seen and says this kind of exercise can only be experienced in the Gambia. Feeding of the vultures, which you don't see nowhere else, so it's very interesting. And since I'm a biologist, that's what interests me especially. So, yeah. Michael Koch, despite being impressed with the vulture feeding, which has been in existence for about 40 years, believes that it is unnatural to feed birds. Uh, it's impressive, but uh, it's not nature, feeding the birds. Uh, I like birds in, in nature. Birds, they have to uh, find their own food, not give food. It's for the tourists. Sertijan <laughs> Jiba tells us more about these scavenging creatures. Vultures, they are very, very important in our community so because um, they keep the place clean. And also these vultures, um, yeah, because um, maybe dead things just like cows or donkeys or if dead fish on the beach side, they clear everything except they leave the plastic there. And these are the, we call them the hooded vultures. So hooded vultures, they are 70 centimeter tall and their wingspan is 175 centimeter. And vultures, they can live nearly 60 to 75 years old or nearly 200. It is feared that vultures in West Africa will soon become extinct as they are killed for food or to have their body parts used for witchcraft rituals. This is reported to have caused a 90% decline in the scavenging creatures population. According to research, Africa has 11 different species of vultures and their scavenging activities contribute to 70% of Africa's carrion cleanup. Animals, especially vultures, need human protection and conservation because their existence has numerous benefits to our environment and human lives. Momo Lamin Choi reporting for QTV News. And over now to business news in detail. An analysis of the recently concluded Africa Investment Forum in Johannesburg identifies four areas of investment for Africa. Invest more in sports and entertainment. The last two years have seen African music, primarily Afrobeats, making serious inroads into the pop charts in Europe and America. American basketball has not only seen an increase in the number of African stars, it has now expanded to include an African league. Remove obstacles which limit the involvement of women in business. The Africa Development Bank found the most pressing issues to be lacking collateral, risk perceptions and poor appreciation of women-operated business models on the part of African banks. Africa's businesswomen predominantly work in the informal sector where data limitations are well known. Provide universal electricity access, a perennial problem in much of Africa. A report launched by the Sustainable Energy Investments team makes 11 recommendations for delivering power to the continent by 2030. Provide more funding for small businesses. Not only must we have we must we provide electricity for our businesses rather, we must be prepared to give them more funding. And from that report, we take a short commercial break. But when we return in international news, we look back at the 50th anniversary of the end of the Biafra War and what are the hopes for peace in Libya. Join us after the break for these stories and more as well as some sports news. It's a start of a new decade and QCell brings you a new and improved 4G MiFi router. You can connect up to 32 devices, yes, 32 devices with the new MiFi router and enjoy the fastest internet service in the Gambia. So go get it now at any of our QCell customer care centers for just $2,500 and subscribe to our ongoing 4G Mega Data promo. For more information, call QCell customer care on 111. QCell, soon you boss, we innovate, orders follow.
Welcome back. In international news, the Biafra War lasted only 30 months, and yet in that time between 1 to 2 million people died, depending on whose statistics one uses. At the time, it was the most devastating war seen on the African continent in the 20th century, which was not a colonial liberation struggle. January 15th marks 50 years since the end of that brutal conflict, despite the Nigerian government saying there was no victor and no vanquished. The con consequences, rather, of the conflict can still be felt today. The short film shows what it meant for some people. The Biafran people were not prepared. They had nothing. They were fighting, they have no gun. They were fighting, they have no bullet. Grandma, what was life like for you before the war? Life was good in the village. Some are traders, some are doing their businesses. Normal, just normal village life. How did it change once the war started? There was no market. There was a market, but the market will start from around yeah. 5 a.m. to 6 to 7 by 7.30. Everybody has gone. No movement because of plane. If the plane has the plane are flying, what we do that time? They told the turtles. Immediately you hear the sound of plane. Take cover. Wherever you find yourself, you enter bush and lie flat on the floor on the ground. You won't even care what is there until the whole thing is over. I lost my parents. My father joined the army. I never didn't come back to today. And because my, mom, my mother, in fact, that was the first time I heard about stroke. She fell down. She shouted. I rushed there. She didn't walk. She didn't talk. After one week, my mother died. Two of my brothers joined the army, and the day they came back home, it was really, they looked like skeletons. So to me, it wasn't good. It was, in fact, nobody used to even mention anything about war to me. Sunday 18th January sees another attempt at getting Libya's warring factions to the peace table. Berlin is to host this latest round of talks and all sides have indicated that they intend to attend. Germany will host what is being billed as an international peace conference in consultation with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. The meeting will be between the factions led by Prime Minister Fayez Sarraj who heads the internationally recognized government of national accord in Tripoli and General Haftar of the Tobruk-based House of Representatives. No one is expecting things to be easy. Both sides had appeared close to agreement only last Monday, 6th January, when Haftar left the Moscow talks without putting his signature to an agreement already signed by Saraj. <music> and joining me now in the studio for a look at today's sporting stories is my colleague Alev Sisei. Thank you very much. And Sumana, uh, we start uh, with women football in the Gambia because the Gambia national under-20 women team is preparing to leave the country to Ouagadougou where they will be playing their first leg uh, for the FIFA under-20 World Cup qualifiers uh, on Saturday. This is the second time that the Gambia is meeting Burkina Faso. The last was in 2018 when the Gambia eliminated Burkina Faso for the African Cup of Nations qualifiers. I mean, the last time Gambia played in a FIFA World Cup uh, tournament was in 2012 when the Gambia under-17 played in Baku, Azerbaijan where they got eliminated in the group stage against France, USA, and uh, Korea. So uh, it's promising to be uh, an interesting encounter uh, in the first leg, and then uh, the, the return leg will be in two weeks' time. Uh, from that story, and Sumana, we proceed uh, with uh, still uh, on football-related matters, because uh, while in Jidda, Saudi Arabia, to attend the Spanish uh, Super Cup final, uh, the Gambia Football Federation President, Lamin Kababajo, did sign an MOU with the uh, counterparts in Saudi Arabia on areas of cooperation, which will include hosting the Gambia national team on training camps. From there, we move to uh, 
a major move in Gambian international football because uh, one of our key players, Musa Baro, has completed a move to Brona from Atlanta after completing his medical task uh, on, on Tuesday. So this described as a great move uh, by the player in order, in order to earn more uh, playing times because uh, he was at some point uh, not having enough playing time uh, at Atlanta. So this is described by uh, many as a great move for the, for the youngster. And then he has been very key for the national team uh, during his appearance for the Gambia in the previous qualifiers. And finally, Ansumana, we look at a very interesting story. I mean, it is very unusual, actually, not unusual to see brothers who are playing football. But here we have four brothers, of course, uh, they're all playing football. But guess what? They are all goalkeepers. And these are the Mandanda brothers. Of course, we have uh, one of them is uh, the oldest is uh, Steve, who is 34 years old, of course, playing in France, playing for Olympic, uh, Olympic Martial. And of course, uh, he was part of the France's uh, 2018 World Cup squad, which actually wa uh, won, the, won the World Cup. Next after him is the 31-year-old Rifi, who plays his football in Romania for Dinamo Bucharest and has also played uh, for DR Congo. And then next to him is a 27-year-old Parfait, who, who plays his football in Spain. And of course, you know, currently also played for, recently played for DR Congo. And then the last uh, of, of them is a 21-year-old uh, Ofa, currently French uh, playing in the French Tafia, uh, U.S. Kretul, uh, Lusitanos. Uh, quite interesting story that, that there. Is, that is a quite an unusual story to have four brothers playing football and all four goalkeepers. Indeed, uh, quite interesting. I mean, it's, it's very normal to see brothers uh, play, play, playing football together, but then having four of them, of course, you know, and then all goalkeepers is quite an interesting story, Ansumano. And just a quick one on the female under-20 team's preparations. How crucial is this technical preparation to the team's, I mean, um, preparations towards the 18th encounter? Of course, it's quite very important because we know that uh, women football is not something that is well endorsed in, in the country. But we have seen over the years uh, the uh, Gambia Football Federation has been doing so much to ensure that you know, women football is, is empowered and those who are into the game are well motivated to make sure that you know, they keep on play, playing. So uh, preparation for these qualifiers is, is very important because at the end of the day, uh, this is the first leg in, in Ouagadougou. And having a win in Ouagadougou will really revive hopes of the team making it to, to the next round where they will face Nigeria. Well, my colleague Alice said they are giving us a rundown of today's sporting stories. And that brings us to the end of this edition of the news. But before we take a leave of you, here's a recap of our main headlines. The chairman and members of the Constitutional Review Commission call on President Barrow and members of the government at State House. Recently knighted physician and a scientist, Professor Satumani Kora, tells us about the prevalence and dangers of hypertension and diabetes in the Gambia. Ahead of an international conference addressing climate change in West Africa, experts briefed the media at MRC. In business news, investing in Africa, what are the four signs of hope that have probably been missed? In international news, today, 15th January, marks the 50th anniversary of the end of the Biafra War. Berlin to host Libya peace talks, there are faint hopes that the chaos which has gripped the North African nation may be coming to an end. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of the news. Do join us tomorrow for more news. Until then, on behalf of the entire production team, thanks for watching.